Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now we Christians sometimes get ourselves confused. Even though Jesus told us to love one another, even our so-called enemies, and even though Jesus told us to forgive others, even our so-called enemies, and even though Jesus told us to never return evil for evil, so often we seem to lose our way. We don't want to follow that path so much of the time. Sometimes we just want to feel powerful and strong Sometimes we want to take revenge instead of turning the other cheek. And so often, Christians don't act any better than anybody else. So often we need to be reminded that by human standards, God's kingdom is an upside-down world that doesn't value the things we think it should and that, in fact, operates in opposite of the way we think it should be. In fact, how many of you remember that Nickelodeon show, You Can't Do That on Television? Oh my gosh, I feel so old or so young, one of the two, I'm not sure which. <laughs> but there was a sketch show for children, and one of the sketches was called Opposite Day, Opposites, and so it would be opposite sketches, and everything was exactly the opposite. Anyway, that's kind of what the kingdom of God is like. It's kind of the opposite of what we think it should be. Our first reading from Isaiah is part of one of the suffering servant psalms that we've read from before. Here we read about someone who has suffered vicariously for the benefit of others. And it's not hard to see why the early Christian church latched onto this passage and interpreted it as a reference to Jesus Christ. It's about someone who brings healing to others by themselves being wounded. It's a story about someone who prays for others, others who are themselves transgressors. All of this, according to the prophet, happened because God willed it happen, and the suffering servant never spoke a word of complaint. Now, scholars aren't in agreement as to who this originally would have referred to, at times, Isaiah's, uh, at times, the writings of the suffering servant appears to refer to the whole nation of Israel, that their suffering is on behalf of the world. Sometimes it sounds like the prophet might be referring to himself. So it's really not always clear who the suffering servant was originally intended to reference. But what is clear is that expectations here are flipped upside down. The chosen one of God, instead of being exalted and greatly honored, instead suffers in service to others. Now, a reading from Hebrews continues that talk about Jesus Christ as our high priest. Last week, we talked about how Jesus, because of his human experience, was a high priest who could sympathize with our life situations. Today's reading mentions becoming God's son. Today I have begotten you and being a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, these are references from Psalm 110, and were originally honoring King David, and would have been used on the coronation of the king, because it's on that day, oh, the king becomes the son of God. In the Old Testament, the king was frequently referred to as the son of God. And Melchizedek, well, Melchizedek is this mysterious figure who shows up in Genesis 14, blessing Abraham and receiving his tithe. We don't really know who Melchizedek is. I suppose if we were sci-fi fans, we could probably say he was like a time traveler from the future or something like that. He just kind of pops up in the story and then never shows up again. But nevertheless, this priesthood of Melchizedek is supposed to be of a higher degree than the priesthood descended from Aaron, which was the priesthood responsible for the rituals of the temple in Jerusalem. This order of Melchizedek has no apparent origin, and it has no end, which makes it appropriate for David, but also now for Jesus. But like all the priests in the Bible, appointed by God. But unlike Aaron and 
his priests, the priest of Melchizedek doesn't have to ask for forgiveness for their own sins, but instead can focus only on the sins of others. He doesn't sacrifice animals, rather he himself is the sacrifice. Again, it's an upside-down thing here. The highest ranking of priests nevertheless sacrifices himself. And our Gospel reading continues this sort of upside-down theme because there's this very human story here where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die, which he has told the disciples repeatedly that's going to happen, and yet the brothers James and John decide to try and win a little bit of uh, benefits ahead of the other ten and obtain the most honored positions in the kingdom of God. They really don't get it. But notice Jesus doesn't say that outright. Instead, he tells James and John that they will endure the same kinds of suffering that he will. To be honored by God means to suffer. Nevertheless, the other disciples, they're still not happy. They're mad at James and John. Jesus has to step in and he reprimands his disciples. Those who wish to be great must be servants. They must be humble slaves to all others. The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom from our perspective. The humble and lowly are the most important. The humble and lowly are the most highly honored. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about Martin Luther's critique of the church of his day how he advocated a theology of the cross instead of a theology of glory. He reminded us that God comes to us in love and vulnerability, and that we are called to imitate God in that regard. The kingdom of God, despite having the word kingdom in it, bears no resemblance to kingdoms set up by men, because the kingdom of God is based on love and service to others whereas we humans prefer power and others serving us. The kingdom of God is based on sharing resources and justice, whereas we humans prefer to hoard resources for ourselves. So often we are like James and John. We want what we think is our fair share, what we deserve. It's funny how often we assume that we deserve something good. But that's not the right way to look at it. The ones God has chosen don't get all the nice things. Instead, they serve others. They take care of others. They show God's love to others. And if the, our friends and our family think that is weak, then so be it. We turn the other cheek. We forgive those who wrong us. A few months ago, I saw a Facebook meme, which I have mentioned before, where the, the writer of the meme says, after studying Jesus, I have come to the conclusion that Jesus saw, said there were two different kinds of people. There were our neighbors, who we are to love, and the others are our enemies, which we are to love. So really, there's only one kind of person in Jesus' world, those that we must love. It's much easier to love good neighbors than it is enemies, though, isn't it? That is always our challenge. At the same time, it's really not that hard for us to understand. It's just hard to live it out. To be great, you have to humble yourself and serve others. Again, that's sort of an upside-down perspective. That's not how the world works. You don't become president of the United States by being humble. You don't become the CEO of a company by serving others. You don't reach the top of the pack, you know, pack by taking care of everybody else. That isn't usually the way our world works, but that's exactly the way the kingdom of God works, that upside-down way. Because although Jesus is at the top of the kingdom of God, he got there by serving everyone else, by giving up himself to everyone else. And that's what we are called to do as well. And that's not easy. It is not easy. 
I don't know about you, but I kind of like some of the nice things about life. I kind of like having things. I also kind of sometimes like to lord it over people. You know, I try not to do it too often, but, you know, Kathy will probably tell you. She's like, oh, Chris is getting really high and mighty on himself right now. Well, she wouldn't say that. She's too nice to ever say that. But she rolls her eyes at me, and I know that's what that means. <laughs> It's, it's hard, though, to be humble all the time. It's hard to remember that we're here to serve because sometimes we want to be served. Why can't somebody else serve us for a change? Why can't somebody else do what we want them to do? And now this isn't about being a doormat, but this is about being humble and giving of yourself. Because to be honored in the kingdom of God is to be humble. To serve others. And so as we go out into this world this week, I want you to be thinking about that. I want you to be thinking about, well, how can I serve others? How can I be humble and caring for others? How can I become the kind of person that Jesus wants me to be? To be someone who gives himself a love for others. So let's be thinking about